Three, two, one, go. As a preliminary matter, this is Brian Sullivan, Chair of the Affordable Housing Trust. Permit me to confirm all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Forrest Bell. Here. Meg Browers. Here. Penny Dye. Here. John Tom Murphy. Here. Okay, staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Christy Parentella. Here. Uh, Vicki Marsh. Hi, Vicki. Hi. Uh, Lee Smith. <clears throat> Hi. Hi, Lee. Hi, everyone. Uh, Alice, we got you at the opening. Anticipated speakers on the agenda. Please respond in the affirmative. I don't know that I have any speakers, so we'll move on. Good afternoon. This is an open meeting. The Affordable Housing Trust is being conducted remotely pursuant to Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. For this meeting, the Affordable Housing Trust is convening via video conference via the Zoom app as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note the meeting is being recorded and all attendees are participating via video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that folks may be able to see you. Take care not to screen share your computer. Anything you broadcast may be captured in the recording. All supporting materials that have provided members of the body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda, unless noted otherwise. We'll turn to the first item on the agenda, but before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business to ensure some accurate meeting minutes. I'll introduce each speaker on the agenda after they conclude their remarks. We'll go through a line of members, inviting each to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or your computer when you're not speaking. Remember to speak clearly in a way that helps generate accurate meeting minutes. For any response, please wait. So the floor is yielded to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in conversation with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. For items with public comment, after members have spoken, the chair will afford public comment to those members of the public that have joined the meeting via Zoom. Members of the public who wish to speak must state their names, be acknowledged, and speak to the chair. Finally, each vote in this meeting will be conducted by a roll call. With that, uh, we will call the meeting to order and a look for an approval of the agenda. Christy, are there any changes, edits? No? No, no edits. Motion to approve the agenda. Thank you, Meg. Is there a second? I'll second. Uh, okay, I think Penny got it. Forrest Bell? Uh, yes, uh, I Brow second. Thank you. Uh, Meg Browers? Aye. Penny Dye? Aye. John Tom Murphy. Aye. And Brian Sullivan's and I. I think everybody. Okay. Um, public comment. Are there any members of the public that would like to make comment or any members of the board as members of the public? Christy. Yes. Thank you. Um, this came in too late to be posted on the agenda. So I just wanted to um, add it in as a public comment. Um, we've been following the Affordable Homes Act very closely over this session um, as it originally included uh, the inclusion of a transfer fee, which has since been removed. Um, but it just went to the Joint Conference Committee um, this past weekend, and that's where the House and the Senate meet to uh, basically try to merge the two House and Senate bills into one. And in this, there's still the seasonal communities designation. So we are encouraging community members both year round and seasonal to reach out to the six members of this conference. Um, everything is listed on the town's website. If you look at the Affordable Homes, uh, sorry, the Affordable Housing Trust website, um, right on there, there's an update on the Affordable Homes Act. And if you click there, it has a template, it has all the emails to send it to. Um, and it's a very quick turnaround. Um, we're asking everybody to have everything submitted by tomorrow at noon. Um, because they're, they started meeting yesterday um, and it's through tomorrow. Um, I'll send this out to trust members as well. And anybody that was on the housing email list received it from the town's office yesterday. Um, so again, it's all listed on the town website um, under the Affordable Housing Trust. Um, this inclusion of the seasonal communities designation would automatically include Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard in this designation and would establish a $50 million bond authorization to fund attainable and affordable housing for seasonal communities. Um, so although we were very sad to see the transfer fee removed, this is another opportunity 
um, to receive funding and to re receive new tools in our toolbox. So we're just encouraging everybody um, in the public to send in their comments um, for this provision. And it, let me just, I wrote it down. It is, I did not write it down. I was like, it's on the website of what the Senate bill number is. Um, at least want to make sure everybody's writing that, uh, writing into them. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. A few people have joined since uh, we're in public comment. Are there any members of the public that have recently joined that want to make public comment? Seeing no action, I'll close public comment. Uh, go to item four, approval of the minutes of June 11th and June 25th. Alice, are these been edited and all set with any comments? Good. Yes, they were edited with Penny's um, edits and Christie's edits. And um, I think Meg also made a comment that I edit. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> their motion on yeah, to approve I'll, the minutes? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of June 11th and June 25th as edited. Great. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Meg. Uh, vote by roll. Forrest Bell. You're Oops. still on mute, Forrest. Hey, excuse me. Go ahead, Penny. Point of order. Yes, I, Penny. I think because Forrest wasn't yet on the on the board, he probably shouldn't vote on these minutes. One, two, three, four. I'm getting a affirmative head shake from Vicky. Thank you. So we'll abstain, Forrest. Christy, did you want to make a comment while I'm in a point of order? Um, I just want to say that when we had the open meeting law violation, they clarified that you didn't need to be present to approve the minutes. So Thank everybody you. can vote on minutes. Okay. Thank you, Christy. Aye. Thank you, Forrest. Meg Browers. Aye. Penny Dye. Aye. John Tom Murphy. Aye. And Brian Sullivan and I. Okay. Uh, item five, announcement. Christy, do you want to make the announcement or do you want me to read it? Nope, I can make the announcement. Um, I just wanted Great. the public and the trust to know um, part of the select board's strategic plan includes a focus area on housing. It's both municipal housing needs and affordable housing. And I'll be giving a very detailed and extensive update on their five housing goals at tomorrow night's select board meeting. Uh, that's July 17th at 5.30 p.m. And it's available in person at the police station or on Zoom. Um, and the everything for that packet has been posted online, so you can also view the PowerPoint for updates on that. Thank you, Christy. Penny? Yeah, um, just a, a sort of general comment that I'd like us to consider, um, not for tomorrow night, but for the future. Um, when we're doing outreach, I think it'd be really helpful to have a list um, of all the units that were created with town funds since the inception of the Affordable Housing Trust. And if there's an issue about privacy concerns, we could do it. We could do it by address without the street number. We could say Main Street, three bedrooms, two baths, deed restriction, eighty percent and below. Um, you know, Pochick Avenue, two bedrooms, two baths, whatever it is, right? I just think having a list of the addresses would be extremely um, powerful, so that people would understand exactly what's going on. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. Any more on announcements? No. Um, Christy, I'm very appreciative of your previous um, updates to the select board. So thank you for the momentum there. Uh, item six, request of an approval of an extension for the license agreement between Barrett Enterprises and the trust for the house that is on 12 Bartlett Road. That is the house move. Um, Little background there, uh, if I may, Christy, there was a telephone pole uh, where the wiring was too low for them to move the house onto the property. There was a wait on the electric company to move the uh, pole. They've installed the new pole, but the line apparently needs to get moved up so they can move the house across the street. I don't have an update on timing, but I know the new pole is in the ground as I I did drive around the traffic the other day as they were installing it. Um, so Christy, if you have more to share. 
I, I was just going to add that they were just ex asking for a one week extension through this Friday. Um, and then just the staff recommendation was to just allow two weeks. So it doesn't need to keep coming back to the trust um, and to give them until July 26th. Great. So do you need more other than seeking a motion to approve an extension until July 26th? No. Lee, do we need anything else other than just that? I'm assuming the, the original license was actually signed by both parties. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I'm, no. I'm, so I'm think getting a yes. Yeah. Yep. I think you're good. Great. Can I have anybody make that motion? I'll make the motion to approve the um, request of an extension of a license agreement between Barrett Enterprises, LLC, and the Affordable Housing Trust Fund at 12 Bartlett Road um, up to two weeks. Great. Thank you, Shanta. Is there a second? second. I second the motion. Great, thank you. Um, Forrest, uh, vote by roll, Forrest Bell. Aye. Uh, Meg Browers. Aye. Penny Dye. Aye. John Todd Murphy. Aye. And Brian Sullivan's and I. Uh, moving to question, license agreement. Item seven, review closing cost assistance program guidelines and qualifications. Um, discussion and action. Um, Christy, if I may, I think we are here to review the limit on closing cost assistant applications currently sits at 175. We had previously taken a vote that that was the max AMI amount that we would fund up to $15,000 of closing cost assistance. Um, since we have received applications up to 240% AMI. And so the question is, do we want to consider a policy change? Um, Christy, more or less on that? No, that really covers it. Um, it was the March 26th meeting that we had discussed going up to 240%, but settled on 175% of AMI. Um, a few meetings later, there was a board comment asking if we would consider going up to 240%. And so I just kind of had wanted to bring it, this was already kind of scheduled to be in front of the trust again to see if there was um, a change in policy. And then as Brian had mentioned, we did receive two applicants um, up to the 240%. Um, our declaration of trust does allow us to serve up to 240%, so it, it wouldn't be outside of our purview to do that. Christy, for me, could you um, clarify the incomes at of one of 175 and 240, the qualifying incomes? Give me one second and I will. Thank you. Uh, open up for questions or comments, uh, Penny. Yeah, I've got it. It's about two hundred and thirty-eight thousand, I think, at the uh, one seventy-five, and at two forty, uh, three hundred twenty-six thousand. Can I ask for a clarification on that, Chair, Mr. Chair, um, for a family size of four, Penny? I believe so, but Christy can confirm. Yes. Um. So if I can, through you, Brian. Yes, please. Um, so the updated numbers as of April 1st through um, HUD is that a family of four at the 175% AMI is $267,930. And the family of four for 240% is $367,440. That's gone up. Yes. Um. A couple other general, I guess, programmatic updates or my question um, on what are what are we funding annually on closing cost assistance and what do we see coming as far as larger projects? I think in the past we knew that we were having a number of applications coming. What does this look like? Um, so we have typically seen about 10 applicants a year that has fluctuated with the Richmond property development. Um, we do know that we have seven Richmond homes. Um, six of them are at the 80% AMI, one was at 175% AMI. I think four of those have already come to us for closing cost assistance. Um, and then we do have the six homes on Weight Drive through Habitat for Humanity um, that would be coming in the next 18 months. But those are the, the main projects we do get um, and those are at all at 80%, the six. I'm sorry, I'm going to cut you off. 
Yes. Go ahead, Penny. Yeah, I just want to kind of refresh our memories. When we started this, I think, was it not like a pilot program to see what the demand was? We never set a budget on it, did we? I don't, think we ever, I don't think we ever set a budget. I think we were trying to satisfy a need, and I can't remember which project it was that was coming online now, it's what, four or five years ago, but there were a number of units that we saw people were having trouble bridging the gap on the lower end of the scale to get their loans. So my, the reason I'm bringing that up is my recollection is that we did not know what the demand was going to be uh, when we started this. So we didn't want to um, limit ourselves, right? And, it, and the demand will vary year to year. And I guess my only concern about making this program available to people earning up to 300 in excess of 350,000 a year is will that in any way negatively impact those that are um, in the lower income brackets? Right. right. Chantal? Um, I'm glad you said that, Penny, because that's since we received this packet and have um I read the agenda that was my concern immediately um while I recognize that 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 there is a need um for it at that level if we're getting these applications um I'm concerned about the folks who who are below making 300 plus thousand dollars a year that will need it um additionally re reading through I can't remember whose packet it was exactly but their letter specifically stated that their um, the the mortgage mortgage uh, company that they're working with stated that they do qualify for closing cost assistance. Um, but if you read our closing cost assistance packet, it specifically states up to one hundred and seventy five percent. But the letter that they wrote said being at two hundred and forty percent, they state that we qualify. So I think there's some confusion there. I don't know what we can do to make sure that we reach out to whoever that mortgage company is or what, depending on where this conversation goes to make sure that they understand the program so that they're not uh, misdirecting people. Thank you, Shanta. Um, Forrest? Um, I have a quick question since I haven't been around. Um, I, this is my second meeting. Um, how, how was the determination made that, that we were going to extend it to 240%? Was it was it, did, did you get together? Was it an arbitrary uh, figure? So, so we have never had that conversation. We're having it right now. Um, the previous conversation we had at back in the March meeting was that we were going to maintain closing cost assistance at 175% and not raise it to 200 or 240. Um, since then, as Chantal points out, uh, some individuals were recommended to apply. So here we are having the conversation about policy based on those applications. And is it something that we want to reconsider the March vote that we had? Okay, and I just have a quick follow-up question. Um, if, 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 if we decide to keep it at 240, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking more of the slippery slope argument that if someone comes in at 250 and they're like, well, that's only 10%, right? And then 260, it's 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 where will it end at that point? So today our our um, authorizing, I, I'm, I'm searching for the word, but our our governing document only allows us to fund anything up to 240. So that is the absolute ceiling that it would ever go. But I think your comment applies to we established a 175, and here we are having a 240. So. Um, <clears throat> Do you, does that answer the question for you first? I, it does. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Uh, Meg? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm struggling a little bit with this because on the one hand, I know that you need to make, you know, eight times the median income to afford a market rate home the median market rate home. So obviously someone making 240 clearly needs assistance. 
at the same time, I feel like some of our programs were at 175, some of our programs were at 240, and I wonder if we should have a conversation about whether we align all of our programs to a certain level or maybe not, um, just food for thought. Um, so I just wanted to make that comment. Thank you. So I think that, that, Meg, that's something I think about a lot as well. And so at the moment, while we can fund up to 240, the current programs we have are the least of locals. We did 175. We have this at 175. We've kind of been at that spot. I think our opportunities for um, deed restriction buy downs up to 240, we need to be able to participate in the marketplace. Um, but for me, my thoughts are I'm kind of in line where Shanta was that I would hate to jeopardize anybody at the beginning of the income scale by funding somebody at a higher end of the income scale down the road. That's kind of my thought. Um, Tracy, I see your hand. Let me see if there's any more board comments before I open it up. Uh, Penny? Yeah. What One of the things that we have to consider in this conversation is that we have not set a budget for this. So we, right. uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to Christy, I believe have the funds to do this. But I also think we need to think about precedent. I mean, it would be more, I would be more comfortable with this if we had budgeted to arbitrarily $200,000 and we only used a hundred of it in a year, for instance. Those are sort of my concerns. Yeah. That's fair. Um, Meg? I also had another thought. What if we tiered our um, grant amount? If we wanted to go up to 240, what if we did half or something like that? If we had the funding to Penny's point, and I don't know how, it, I don't know, do we generally, have we ever turned someone down? Have we ever had more applications than we were prepared to grant? Um, uh, Not to date. I, I do fear about setting the budget and then running out of the money on 240s and not being able to. Um, Christy. Thanks. Um, just one other thing to put out there for thought is if we are launching the year on deed restriction pilot program, and that is going up to 240%, if we're looking for those homeowners to be eligible to apply for this program, we're not. Um, just another thought to, to think about. But those properties already would have a rest year round restriction on them if they had a deed rider at 240%. So I don't think we would be buying those in general, right? Unless it was a buyer willing to put a restriction on, that's what you're saying. Okay, got it. Um, come to Tracy. Um, hi, sorry. I, I just want to clarify, like I kind of want a clarification, um, not just in my role as you know, real estate specialist, but just generally. Um, so all we're knowing talking... being. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, yeah. So, are we talking about like that's where I'm confused? Is the is the properties that are privately owned that apply the deed restriction and are two forty? They could apply for this, but then also the affordable housing trust that has properties that go to two forty they would be applying for it as well. So there's no discretion between the two. So this would only be on closing costs for buyers who are applying for the up to $15,000 of closing cost assistance loan on a property that has a restriction up to 240% AMI, whether it was a trust property or an independent property. I, I was this just is, thinking gener generally like, you know, in other states, I, I think you probably know, Brian, that it's it's kind of common for the seller to offer, you know, a closing cost. Uh, but if they're giving the deed and if they're giving the deed restriction, then they're already getting the subsidy. And so anyways, that's kind of my thought process there. Um, other than that, I have no comment. Thank you, Tracy. 
Are there any members with more questions or comments, or does anybody want to make a motion on the policy, either to keep it as is or make a change and raise the limit? Any? Yeah, is there not a third option, which is to take more time to really look at this and maybe act on these requests now? Is that not a third option? Well, I, I'll defer to either Vicki or Lee, but I don't know, since we previously voted at 175, I don't know that we can take these applications unless we were to make a change. So we would just have to continue the applications. I, I just, I'm really struggling with what what is our bucket of funding out of which this is coming? How much is there there? Are we gonna limit it to a certain amount on an annual basis when we do a budget? I'm, I'm just struggling with that. Okay. Um, I'm gonna come to Shanta. I think she's got a thought on that or a thought uh, in general. Can I make a motion to take no action on the on the changes to the um to the the current um AMI restrictions to the closing cost assistance program and we move forward with the uh, these closing cost um applications, assistance program applications. Is that a possibility? Take no action on I, the, it was it was an agenda item to Yeah, it's yeah, so yeah, your motion, yeah, you I'm just trying to think it through in my brain. Yes, your motion to take no action is now on the table. Um is there a second on the take no action? Um somebody want to make a second for discussion? I'll second for discussion. Thank you. So for discussion, Chanta, I think if we take no action where we are then by default, we have to continue the applications and or um, reject them for today. So knowing that, um, does anybody else have any comments on, and, and Vicki and Lee, uh, please help correct me if I'm headed the wrong direction on my thought process there. Um, okay, I got a thumbs up, right, right direction. Meg, and then Forrest. Could we... So this is so this is discussion on discussion for the motion on yeah. the motion versus mm -hmm. changing directions. Right. So right. Okay. So I the two applications for today are over 175, right? Correct. Right. Okay. Well, I I guess I have discussion, but it's not related to take no action directly. It's just um I feel like we could be creative about how we work with this program and help the most families as possible who are obviously in the lower income brackets. I just don't know that we can do it today. And if we don't approve these applications today, they're gonna not have the money for their closing, right? So I, I would like to have further conversation. Okay, um, Forrest on the... Yeah, that that that's kind of my question. Um, um, it it is they relied on on advice. I, I'm not sure from from you know whom, but um, it, it's just they they applied upon the advice of someone saying that you know you should, you should go for it. There's probably money in the budget, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm I'm worried about them relying on CCAP as 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 Meg said to to kind of close on the property, which which I I, I I would hate to be the one to kind of pull that rug out from under him. And, um, you know, that, that, that's my only concern. Thank you for uh, Shanta. Um, so just to explain my, the motion, it's taking no action on changing it today so that we can one, come up with a budget and do this a little bit more fiscal, fiscally responsible later on down the road. Um, I do recognize that both of these applicants are closing on the 8th of August. So kicking the bucket down the road might anyway impact these people negatively um, because as it stands right now, if we choose to discuss this, for, you know, continue this conversation about it, um, there's no way Chrissy can come up with a budget sitting right there. Uh, or maybe you can, I don't know. I don't know if your brain's a calculator. <laughs> I don't think that's a fair request. <laughs> um, 
but it's still, regardless, it still puts us in a position where we can't help these folks today. Um, and I don't want to speak to the rest of the application that isn't publicly available, but if you look at everything, I, 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 I personally don't see where they won't be able to close just reviewing the entire application if we don't approve this fifteen thousand um, dollars. I'm I'm torn as well because at the end of the day, it is very difficult to purchase a home on Nantucket, um, and any assistance that folks can get is is so helpful. But I just it's where the affordable housing um, trust fund, and we're here to help a certain um, income bracket. And it, I think it's great that we have programs that service folks up in various brackets. Um, so that's that's just my my two cents on that. Okay. Um, and I see your hand up, but I don't know that I can take public comment during the discussion of a motion. So I'm looking. Okay, I'm gonna yeah, I, and I'm sorry. I, um, so we have a uh, motion on the table that has been seconded to take no action um, on this. Is there any more discussion? Seeing none, I will take a vote by roll call. Uh, Meg Browers, aye. Petty Die, aye. John Tom Murphy, aye. Boris Bell? Aye. And Brian Sullivan's an aye. Okay, so Christy, we'll bring this back. Um, it sounds like the request from the board is for a budget um, and a little bit more perspective. Um, and do you want to make a comment for thought for a future agenda item? Yes, thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't understand that was your protocol that you're doing. But anyway, yeah, I just wanted to mention that the price that the 240 AMI household is paying, the sale price is based on what they can afford at the level. So just wanted to remind people that they are paying $995,000 for the home. So that was the way we backed into that was figuring what their interest rate, the homeowner's insurance, um, HOA fees, ins um, all sorts of stuff, this formula that we use. So it will make a big difference that closing cost because they are kind of stretched to the place that's affordable to them on a monthly basis anyway, in order to have their housing costs at 30% of their total income. So um, just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you, Ann. Um, so with that, I'm gonna come to, let's see. So item number eight, um, so the applications, we can't take action on these today based on that vote. So we'll move these to a forward agenda um, if the applicants want to stay on, I guess. Christy? Um, we, we don't have another meeting before they close. Okay. So I would need a All motion right. to deny their applications. Okay. So item uh, eight, looking for uh, on the application for eight honey suckle drive, um, looking for a, mo or is it an automatic uh, motion to deny the application? I'm kind of looking to either Lee or Vicky to lead a member here. I don't know what you mean by automatic. Well, like since the program doesn't apply at this point to the application, <clears throat> Yeah, I, I don't know that you need a vote of the trust if, if they're not eligible. Okay. Christy, are you comfortable with that? Yep, so we'll reach back out to the applicants and tell them that they're not eligible. Okay. Meg? Would it be uh, a good, you know, good practice for us to set another meeting to specifically work through the CCAP program and try to put them on an agenda before they're closing? If Christy forward in that direction? Well, ideally that's would be the perfect solution given the timing of finance, um, procurement and everything. This is really the deadline to get things um, that we usually do 30 days in advance for a closing cost. So even this was stretching our timeline to have it approved today. Um, so it really would be difficult for staff to be able to execute that.
So I think my understanding is I can move beyond item eight because the uh, the applications don't qualify and move to item nine. Um, looking to for a vote to approve and execute the deed rider containing affordability restriction up to 240 on these properties at um, 8 Honeysuckle Drive and 10 Honeysuckle Drive. Christy, do you want to elaborate in any way? Yeah, so I'll open it up and then pass it over to Vicki. Um, this was part of um, the May 21st agenda. The um, Housing Nantucket came to the trust to ask for the trust to hold the deed writer with a year-round occupancy and an affordability restriction. Uh, in exchange, the trust approved funding of $45,000 per property, so a total of $90,000 um, for the two units. And Vicki and, um, and council has been working on some of the questions that were outlined in the May 21st uh, meeting. And so I'm gonna pass it over to Vicki um, to bring us up to date. Great. Thank you, Christy. Thank you. Great to see everybody. Um, so I have um, submitted for your review um, a, an affordable, I call it an affordable housing deed rider. It also contains the year round um, owner occupancy restriction in it as well. Um, and so the original, the original um, restriction that was drafted by Brian Swain I've taken, and there's a red line version and a clean version for you, um, but I've gone through this. And so um, he had originally called it a restriction and um, I have subsequently um, identified it as an affordable housing deed rider. And this, this deed rider um, follows pretty much the format that EOHLC uses um, for deed riders um, in affordable housing projects um, in ownership situation. So um, it, it covers all of the bases as far as the actual process for um, resale of an affordable, you know, one of these affordable units. It also covers, you know, um, uh, enforcement, um, monitoring agent. So it has much of the same language, um, you know, as the EOHLC um, deed writers have. But what we've added into this is the fact that um, this deed rider is going to be held not by the municipality, namely the town, but is going to be held by the trust. Um, and, it, you know, the trust has the authority to be able to hold these um, deed riders. So um, as a result of that, what it allows um, and gives a, a benefit to the to the trust is that the restrictions instead of just being um, expiring in 30 years, which is um, the statutory requirements under chapter 184, section 27, um, they're able to be in, per in perpetuity so that um, they will always maintain their affordability and they also will always have in perpetuity a year round um, owner occupancy restriction. So that's a, a really big benefit for the fact that the um, town is not holding this and instead it's the trust. Um, and I defined, um, so the affordable housing restriction is up to 240% AMI. And I defined the year round um, occupancy restriction as being, um, 10 months of each consecutive 12 month period, which is what we've um, decided to use and which what's used, I believe in the covenant program as well. So then if you followed through the, and scroll through the rest of the document, um, pretty much, like I said, it covers all of the other things that are in the EOHLC um, deed riders. And I, I've deleted the references to restrictions um, and instead called this deed rider throughout the document. So you'll you'll note that as well. So then um, if you look at, let's just get to it. Um, section eight, um, which is covenants to run with the property. Um, I identify there the fact that this is, um, uh, the restrictions are an affordable housing restriction and a year round um, owner occupancy restriction. And uh, the affordable housing restriction is um, defined as covered under general laws, chapter 184, section 31, and um, has the benefit of section 32 as well. Um, 
And again, as I had said earlier, it's going to be able to be held in perpetuity. Um, and in the event that there is um, an operation of law which restricts or limits um, the term rather than being in perpetuity, it can't be less than 99 years. Um, so we've built in a 99 year term minimum in this, which um, we've been doing customarily um, for most of these restrictions. Um, and then you get to enforcement and the, the monitoring agent and the trust have the right to be able to enforce the uh, restrictions that are in the deed rider. And um, we, we have followed um, a part of the program that is in the Covenant House guidelines, which allows for a $300 per day um, or per violation, um, <clears throat> I guess, fee um, that would be due in the event that they violate any of the terms of the restrictions or the deed writer itself. And um, so that that is a provision that we've also added in here, which is different than the EOHLC um, deed riders. So I think that's pretty much um, the the basis for the deed rider itself, and the and the fact that we've outlined these two restrictions um, within within the rider. Um, so if you have any questions here. I have a question, Vicki. Um, while you were describing the document, I received an email nine minutes ago from Brian Ryder that looks like there's a redlined version of the document um, with a couple paragraphs of kind of questioning some stuff. I don't know. I see you are on it. Um, I don't know if we're ready to continue this conversation based on his email or we need to take it later in the agenda or... Well, perhaps, you know, um, I had offered these as, you know, a four-year review. I didn't know whether we'd be in a position to approve these final documents today anyway. Um, I had not heard back from Brian, you know, since when I sent the documents out. So this is the first I've heard of it. So, you know, I'd okay. like an opportunity to be able to look at it and comment further. Uh, okay, great. I just, I don't want to move us to a, a vote unless you obviously right. had that opportunity. Um, Tracy, I see that you may have seen this as well. Um, yes, I, it's pretty extensive, Vicki, uh, okay. the, the comments. So you should uh, review this. Yeah, okay. thank you. Uh, so uh, with that, I think it's probably best just to hold the item and continue, um, Christy. Um, just a clarifying question for Vicki. So these, um, the deed writer is supposed to be put in place when they close on August 8th and mm -hmm. our next meeting is August 7th. Um, do we need to, do we need to host a <laughs> meeting in between uh, to be able to review this one item agenda? So yes, ideally if, if, the goal is to have this done in time for that August eighth closing. Um, you know, I'd have to work out the terms of this with Brian. Um, you know, prior there too, so that when I come to the meeting, hopefully, um, you know, we we ironed out all the other things. I guess the other question is before we stop our discussion on this is perhaps um, does anybody else have any questions or comments on the document that's before you? So I could um, either explain it or respond to it or include some of your comments in this document. So um, I don't know if, if any of you have any comments. I think Penny has one, or maybe it's not on the document, but in general. Penny? Yeah, just very quickly, um, Ms. through you, Mr. Uh, Chair, my comment is on the timing of this. This is really important to um, the project at Wiggles in terms mm -hmm. of funding that we stay on track with this and get this done. Thank you. Yep. Christy, so I think happy, did you have your... I'm happy to just continue, you know, getting getting this ready um, as best I can. Um, I'll just have to try to work this out with Brian. Christy, did you have any? Did you have a follow up? I thought I saw your hand a minute ago. No. Okay. Vicky, thank you for your work on this. Sorry to throw it in there at the last second. Literally, I'm listening to you talk about the document, and I see the email. So. 
Um, no, I appreciate that. But like I said, if any of you have any questions or comments that you want me to consider in, in when I revise this, um, please let me know. I'm really happy to hear to explain anything or to respond. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so we'll keep that item open, carry to a future agenda, and we are on item 10, quarterly update. Christy. I think Anne has her hand raised. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Tracy. Anne, yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Tracy, and thank you, uh, Brian, for calling on me. I guess I just wanted to mention what the concerns were, what, what Brian's, because it, it can be summarized pretty easily, what why everything looked great Vicki and you brought up a lot of great points as far as like different tweaks of language we were all fine with all of that mm -hmm. the part that and and I think we tightened it up with the 10 out of 12 months per year versus the principal re mm -hmm. residence I think all of that was great the one place where I think Brian brought was asking if it was a, a big deal for you or not was just the fact that the um, monitoring agent was receiving the funds for enforcing the um, deed restriction itself because we noticed that it was switched to the affordable housing trust into a fund that was um, operated by the trust itself. So I think the reason why we were saying to come to the monitoring agent was because we have, um, we're the enforcement agency. So that's why we would be the ones who are following up and expending a lot of resources to try to get any units that were outside of compliance within compliance. So um, that was the mentality why we were saying that it should be the to paid to the monitoring agent. So if that was something that you were okay with just changing back to the monitoring agent, then I think we would be ready to sign the document as you presented it to us yesterday. Or yeah, it was yesterday. So I had originally, um, I, I saw that difference um, and I changed it to the trust because in the EOHLC documents, um, the municipality, even though there's a monitoring agent, the municipality is the one that receives those fees. And so consistent with the way the um, uh, EOHLC document had been drafted, um, and there is a monitoring agent, the monitoring agent doesn't get those fees, but the town does. So I, I followed through and gave those funds to, um, to the trust. So I would have to have a discussion with the trust as to whether um, they are willing to forego those fees um, that I might have thought they were entitled to. Thank you. So, uh, so Vicki, do you want to do you want to look at the collective document before we kind of yeah. edit by committee here and then we can have that discussion collectively? I, I think that would be helpful, Brian. Um, you know, I haven't had an opportunity to actually read what he says there at, at all. Yeah. So I think that would be that would be helpful. And okay. um, and then we can work through um, how the trust, you know, views that. You know, great. Okay, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. Thank you. Um, and just to follow up, Ellis and I will touch base with town admin on when the Zoom would be available for another meeting, um, before the closing of this. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um. So with that, now we'll move to the select board quarterly update. Thank you. Um, so different than tomorrow's update, so tomorrow's select board update is on all things through the housing department and um, specifically to the select board's strategic goals. Um, on August 7th, I'll be giving the quarterly report from the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Um, so in your packet, uh, which is also posted online for anybody to follow along, um, and just kind of highlighted um, things from this quarter, how our housing construction is going in programs and initiatives that we've been working on. Um, so I just plan on touching base with an update on the Affordable Homes Act, um, talking through the RFP process um, for our vacant land, which is our, our next agenda item, <laughs> and um, a couple of the projects that we have been working on, including um, the grant to housing Nantucket for um, 
60, uh, 66 Pocheck have and the grant to Richmond that's going to help us stay in safe harbor at the end of this year. Um, we also had two lotteries um, that were a result of funding from the trust, um, one through Habitat for Humanity and one through Housing Nantucket. Um, both of them just ended. Um, and so I'll just be reporting on those items as well. Um, I'll also give a brief update on the year-round deed restriction pilot program and the lease to locals um, grant. And so all that's outlined in your packet. And if you guys had anything else, um, feel free to email me um, anything else that you wanted to add to the agenda. And I'll be putting that PowerPoint together um, and save the date if you want to attend. Thank you, Christy. Any questions for Christy on the update? Seeing none, we'll move to uh, review request for proposal RFPs. Christy, I'm kicking this one to you because this is a big one. Oops, sorry, you missed Penny? one. Oh, I did? I'm yeah. sorry, mm -hmm. item 11, um, subsidized housing inventory list. Thank you. Yes, um, so I'm going to share my screen. a little bigger maybe okay can everybody see this yes i can okay. um so i just wanted to touch base about where we stand um on our subsidized housing inventory list um this was again a board comment uh, a couple of meetings ago to see kind of where the funds have been spent from the affordable housing trust and kind of what projects are in the timeline, um, kind of on the horizon. And so what this does is really lay out. So to remind everybody, you know, the state's chapter 40B law mandates that 10% of our year round housing stock is deemed affordable and deed restricted. And so that goal for us is to create 618 units of deed restricted house, year round housing. And the way that we can add, the, add to this is either through rental or home ownership opportunities. Uh, the state's program really incentivizes rentals because while 25% of the units would be restricted, all rentals in the development would count towards the subsidized housing inventory list. Uh, so you really kind of stretch, um, stretch those units. So as a policy, the trust has been focused on creating units of rental. So this lays out over the next couple of years um, how we plan to get to that number of 618. Um, so as of right now, the EOHLC, the last time that they've public, publicly um, put out a list is January of 2023, and they had 332 units on our list. We're adding to that um, this year. We have the Sandpiper to Richmond home ownership opportunities um, that we provided a grant to accelerate the construction of those. Uh, we have Tacoma Green, which is at six fairgrounds, another rental. Um, development and they're planning on pulling building permits by the end of this year. We have four habitat homes for home ownership um, over on Waite Drive and we have uh, the Richmond Gooseberry Place. We've been talking about the 55 unit which is the last rental um, phased rental project in their development. Um, so in total we'll be adding 129 units this year and our number will be going up to seven and a half percent towards our 10 percent goal. Um, we've purchased vacant land throughout the island and my goal with our next agenda item um, is to have those developments um, add over the next couple of years to keep us in safe harbor and so we need to add either 31 units for one year of safe harbor or 62 units for two years of safe harbor. And so at the end of this year, with all of these being added, we will have two years um, of safe harbor, but we don't wanna stop the progress. So we'll continue to be adding, um, but we'll just wanna make sure that we're hitting that target. Um, and it's what's added in a calendar year, just um, to clarify. So by 2027 with these projections, um, we will be hitting that number of 618 um, with the big asterisk of some potential things that are kind of being discussed, um, either in executive session or ideas that have been brought forward, and then kind of a TBD um, that we're hoping either through deed restrictions or another project that might come to fruition. These were the units that we would need to add. 
Um, so this really just kind of highlights how we plan to add to get to our 10% number. Um, and that again is only the state's requirement. And I think it's very clear to everyone on the trust and everybody on the select board and the community um, that we'll need more housing than this uh, to satisfy our year round community. Um, I just wanted to give that update and happy to answer any questions. Penny? Yep, I think, um, Christy, it might be helpful to remind people that this is a moving target that changes with the um, decennial census. Is that right? So in 2030, well, there will be another census and they won't certify those numbers till sometime 2031 or two, but that number could go up. Correct. And so previously with the 2010 census, our target um, was 490 units. And then when they did the 2020 census, which didn't actually get certified till 2023, that increased us to 618. Um, so that's really why I said like, we'll hit that 10% in 2027. You know, ideally that would be our goal, um, but we would want to keep adding things and keep having a plan for moving forward because in 2031, we might have a new number. And I, I just want to add, because I think it's helpful for the public to understand this, that the units count when the building permits are issued. Is that correct? It depends on the type of project, but that is usually when they're added. Thank um, you. With new develop with new construction. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Christy? Seeing none, thank you, Christy. Now we'll jump into the one that I tried to open before, 12, um, RFP review and discussion. So I'm gonna bring this back to you, Christy. Yes, um, and I'm gonna also have um, Rachel Field join us for this discussion, but I will get us started. She's already um, here. Okay, perfect. <laughs> um, so Rachel's been helping me sort through all of these RFPs. Um, and so just in case there's any questions, I asked her to join us today as well. Um, so if you guys recall, we launched the RFP for 135 and 137 Orange Street last summer. Um, we received one bid for that RFP. And after review, um, that bid ultimately needed to be rejected based on um, the need for funding. So one of the ideas that came out of it was to have an RFP committee. We had a few, uh, it was Brian from the trust, um, Vicki was part of that. We also had um, Mass Housing Partnership part of the discussion, Tracy was part of it. We had a little group of people in Brian Terpitt get together and talk about how can we relaunch the RFP and make it more attractive for bids. And one of the discussion points was to bundle the RFPs together so that a potential developer um, could either bid on one or bid on all, but we might attract some um, larger developers or just um, make it more attractive if people could have multiple projects to work on over multiple years. Um, so I just kind of wanted to review where the RFPs stand. There hasn't been many changes to the RFPs itself. These are all things that the trust had approved in January of 2023. Um, so everything's in your packet um, that's been loaded onto our software to launch these. And just to give, I'm just gonna kind of go through what we have as a quick recap and happy to answer any questions. Um, so starting with 135 and 137 Orange Street, um, the potential for this is for it to be 32 units and up to 57 bedrooms. Um, we would have 25% of these be restricted at 80% AMI or less. And there's things that make the bid either more attractive or less attractive um, with you know, more affordable units being um, the more attractive approach. Um, this would be under the workforce housing bylaw and it would, um, it's over the two parcels of 135 and 137. The land bank did purchase 141 Orange Street and provided an easement to us. And so that's in the RFP um, as well as um, kind of a need for a new NRTA bus stop um, to be included in part of this development. So those are kind of the main highlights um, of the RFP that I just wanted to remind the trust about. 
I don't know if there's any questions about this specific one. Any concept on timing? Um, so all of them, once we get through um, the next three, um, would be the, the end of August, um, would be when they'd be ready to go. Um, one of them was just getting a clarification um, on a few of these to have sign off from you, and then we can get the process moving. Um, so for 16 Vesper, to just remind everybody, the trust originally purchased 18 Vesper from UMass Boston, um, and we worked with the hospital and did a swap of their land at 16 Vesper and our parcel at 18 Vesper. Um, and what we have is three oversized lots um, that were subdivided um, prior to the sale to the trust. Um, these lots can produce up to 17 units of housing with up to 24 bedrooms, and that's under current zoning. Um, given 17 units with 24 bedrooms, it most likely would be a lot of one bedrooms um, and a few two bedrooms that would be allowed under current zoning. Um, one thing that came out of the discussion of the RFP and talking with planning is that because they are oversized lots, there is an option to go to the ZBA um, and change it to five lots instead of three. It would still stay at the number of units of 17, but would allow an increase in the number of bedrooms up to 40. Um, so this would just allow us to get a few more two bedroom units in the development. Uh, the big asterisk that you know, more bedrooms means more parking requirements for the development. Um, this could either be something that staff takes on in going through the ZBA, or we can leave the RFP as is and the potential developer could take this on as, um, you know, if that's the project that they want to do, they could go to the ZBA. Um, and talking with the ZBA administrator, there was no pushback from the ZBA about three lots. It was just what was presented to them. Um, so I don't think that it would be a huge risk um, to the potential whoever bids on this. Um, and again, the, the biggest challenge with this lot is the parking. And so increasing the number of bedrooms may not be um, kind of as ideal. So I just didn't know if the trust had any feedback on this RFP. Anyone looking to for comment or thoughts? I see none, Christy. Okay. Um, next we have seven Amelia. This is something that was purchased um, in 2019 between the town and the Affordable Housing Trust. Um, this is a maximum, if there was no commercial aspect to it, of three units with a maximum of eight bedrooms. We could add in a commercial component, um, and that would limit us to two units, but would have no bedroom count. Um, again, a future bidder could go to the planning board for a waiver um, to increase that back up to three units, um, and most likely if there was any sort of commercial piece, they would need a special permit from the planning board. board. Um, so all that could be part of the package. So I would just recommend that we put out the RFP as is and you know, the potential bidders can decide if they wanna make any alterations. My, my only question on that one is, I thought that the, on that street, the first floor had to be commercial. Um, um, is is was it an HOA requirement or a zoning requirement that we're getting waived? I I'm, we've asked planning and every and um, Dan Malloy and everybody, and there's no requirement for the okay, commercial. Okay, cool. I personally have no alterations. Anybody else have question or comment? Seeing none, Christy. Okay, so the last one is twelve and twelve R Bartlett Road. Um, we kind of have two options that we could do here. One, um, it's currently zoned to CN, and CN allows for apartment buildings by special permit. And given the size of the lot, you could go to the planning board for a three lot subdivision. So that would allow 12 units with 24 bedrooms, and you would just need the planning board approval. And that's with the current zoning, um, 12 units, 24 bedrooms. Um, the other option 
would be to go to town meeting and rezone this into R5. And R5 would allow for duplexes by right. And so you could put um, on the same lot up to 10, I'm sorry, up to five duplexes, which would be 10 units. Um, and duplexes don't have a bedroom uh, limit. And these could either be condoed for ownership or they could continue to be rent rented. And so with this, I just wanted to bring it to the trust if we thought that this is better utilized as a rental. Again, it's kind of what we've been planning for. It's what's on our shy projection as a rental. But given the opportunity that was presented, I just wanted to get um, a clarification from the trust. If they, if you wanted it, it would have to go to town meeting to get rezoned. Um, and then it could be a potential home ownership opportunity. Uh, Christy, I'm sorry if I didn't pick this up, but did you say the number of units and bedroom count in the existing? So the existing would be 12 units with 24 bedrooms. Okay. And those could be in a variety of configurations, one, twos, mm -hmm. and threes. Okay. Does anybody have thoughts, Penny? Yeah, I have an opinion. Um... <laughs> Not surprisingly, that um, I am not comfortable for projects that we're doing working outside of existing zoning unless there's a very good reason to do it. That's it. Okay, so in 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 general, you would be opposed to rezoning it in a different way. For me, on this project, the thing that I I'm glad I, I thought there was a lower bedroom count restriction. So I'm glad to know that it was higher. In 24 units, we can house families close to the school. Um, 12 I units. Think that that's 24 exciting. bedrooms. 24 bedrooms <laughs> in 12 units, excuse me. So there's not the potential not to be too many single, un single bedroom units. Um, I think it's important that we maintain focus on the shy list. Um, and as a rental unit, as a rental project, they will all count. So I think that that's appealing. Personally. Anyone else have comments or thoughts? Seeing none, Christy, I say. That now, do you, do you need an action from the group to move them out? Just a general update. No, it's just a general update. Um, every I just wanted to make sure that everybody was comfortable. Like I so said, there haven't been changes since the January 2023 versions. Um, and so what we'll do is work with finance to get these launched um ASAP. And um it was just helpful. Like I said, when we went through the exercise of digging into them, um, there were some questions around what was allowed under zoning. Um, for example, like Seven Amelia had that it could be workforce housing, which the lot is not large enough for that. So we just had gone through the exercise of making sure we had everything correct. And in that, I had some feedback from engineers in the town planning office that I just want to make sure the board was aware of before we issued the RFP and not to find out after the fact. So I agree with everybody that you know we want to stay focused on the shy list and focused on rentals at the moment, but I just want to make sure that this was public information before we issued them. Great. Thank you, Christy. Um, so that brings us to item 13. Um, look for a motion to adjourn the public session to reconvene an executive session for the discussion of purchase, lease, or exchange of property where real value um, of real property. Would anyone like to make that motion? Yeah, I'll make the motion um, where an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the negotiating position of the trust and the chair so declares. Thank you, Penny. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Chantal. Vote by roll call. Mike Browers. Aye. Force Bell. Aye. Penny Dye. Aye. Chantal Murphy. Aye. And Brian Sullivan's and I. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.